but the spirit within you will help you to discern truth you know in your daily life and the things that you're reading and watching and hearing other people say it'll help you to separate out the wheat from the chaff you know Hello my friends, really looking forward to doing this video today because it's about a subject that's close to my heart. Somebody left a message on one of my videos recently. I've been doing lots of shorts, I don't know if you've noticed, uh, that are to do with Christianity, the indwelling Christ, the Holy Spirit, lots of stuff that perhaps I wouldn't have in the past talked about a lot on the videos that I make. And the little part of me that thinks, is this going to cost me and that people will decide they won't listen anymore? I always think that that's a possibility. But I really think that this is something that's really relevant at this time. People are searching for something deeper and more meaningful and substantial. And Christianity is so broad. Did you know how many Christian denominations there are in the world? Take a guess before you Google it. Well, I'll tell you, 45,000. 45,000 different denominations, each with their own emphasis. It's not that they're all saying something different necessarily, but they're perhaps emphasising something different for their own reasons, maybe to do with their cultural situation, what they think is important and so it can be bewildering and if you're somebody who's feeling drawn to the person Jesus and wanting to follow him and have this mystical relationship, spiritual relationship with him, it can, uh, it can be really hard to choose who to listen to, let's just say, because you know, you, you're going to get different versions. And some of it might be resonate with you more than others do. So what I'm going to be teaching on this channel is mystical Christianity. Here's what somebody said anyway. I'm so excited to have found your channel. I've been interested in spirituality, mysticism and spirituality for most of my life. However, over the the last several months I felt a strong pull towards Jesus Christ. I have reflected and invited him into my heart and it has caused a shift for me. Now I feel stroke here, a high calibre of guidance is able to come through. I feel it to be the Holy Spirit and just this week I had dreams where some understanding of Sophia, true forgiveness and healing were able to come through something clicked into place. And then she's asking if I could talk about the esoteric significance of Holy Communion and Eucharist, which yes, I will do. Not in this video, however, I just wanted to reference this. Uh, th that will be for another video dedicated to it because in this video, I am going to speak specifically about indwelling Holy Spirit. I made such a short about this and somebody wrote and said, could you go into more detail with the indwelling Holy Spirit on a video? So that's what this video will be dedicated to. What I'm particularly excited by is that these are both of these people and I'm making this assumption from what you've said and also your username uh, on YouTube that you are perhaps from the spirituality camp if you like you know you, you you've, you've been interested in spiritual spirituality as opposed to traditional religion and yet you feel drawn towards this holiness teaching this sanctification teaching that is is biblical, it's there in the New Testament. And it's largely the, the, the main activator of this sanctification process that's an inward mystical process is the Holy Spirit. I'm just not sure we always get that teaching online if you were to look up Christianity and Google. I'm not sure you get it taught in the way that I'm gonna be teaching it. So um, yeah, it's a real, it's exciting for me to be able to share how I understand it as I've learned from study and my own experience.
The first thing to say is indwelling Holy Spirit. When we talk about Holy Spirit, it can be confusing as a title because we think, are we talking about something different to Jesus? And conceptually, in my mind, even still, it's just the way that we work as uh, as, as humans. Our mind tries to separate it out because they sound as though the language we're using, we're giving them names, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So our brain wants to think of them as separate objects. And the doctrine, the teaching will always explain, always tell you that these are one in essence, co-equal in power and glory. Try to get your head around that, it's almost impossible to do so. And I don't think theoretical teaching is really what we're after. The way I understand it personally is there's one. Just think of the unity, one God, who we can experience in different ways. And I think that even these names, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, are just concessions to our humanness. All of these names that we use, um, well, too certainly, relate to family members, don't they? Father, Son. They re they're about relationship. And Holy Spirit, yeah, well, referred to as He, although in the Eastern tradition, Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Church, they have Sophia as the third person of the Trinity, so it's she. And that gives you a balance of the masculine and the feminine, which I really like. Sophia does appear in the Old Testament in Proverbs and the Song of Solomon, uh, spoken of as the wisdom of God. But given this feminine person, persona, uh, referred to as she. And so it's quite nice to think of uh, a she and a he as a marriage. You, you, you get this idea a lot in Christian mysticism of Christ as the lover to the, the groom, to the bride, who is the church or the soul. It's the soul that wants to be in union with the lover. And so that's one metaphor that's used a lot. Now this is all in the Bible. I don't want to uh, bamboozle you with lots of Bible verses. It's actually in John, the Gospel of John. And if you read from about 14 onward, chapter 14 onward, that's when Jesus talks about leaving the Holy Spirit. He says, I need to go and leave you soon, but I'm going to ask the Father and he'll leave another to be with you. And he uses the word uh, para, para, I forget what it is that it's in that's translated in the Greek. Parakleton is the actual Greek, which means intercessor, consoler, comforter, or helper. It can be translated in all those different ways. Often advocate is the word that's used first for it. He's like an advocate that is with you in my absence. And now I don't I don't know if this is something that uh, is a bit like the Atman that you have in Hinduism, where the Atman is the eternal soul that never incarnates and then uh, is always there for you. And so that's the Jesus is saying, I'm returning to my father, meaning he's going back to his disembodied state that is in heaven, if you like, that's not incarnated. And therefore, in that sense, in a physical sense, he's not going to be present anymore on earth. And so he's leaving the Holy Spirit in his place who will be your helper, hold space for me and guide you into all truth. He'll remind you of everything that I have told you and also will guide you into all truth. Now that's reading from John chapter 14 onwards to chapter 16, uh, that you can, you can read that for yourself. I'll put the notes, in the notes I'll, I'll, I'll put the ref exact references of where to read things, but I'm not going to sort of spend a lot of time quoting directly. I just wanted to sort of talk about the ideas more generally. You know, if you were trying to live your life, the Bible is going to help you so far by giving you an overview of the life of Jesus so you get to know his main teaching and the story of his death and resurrection and you understand the themes. But in terms of living your own life you you can't just use it like oh i need a, i need to know today and open it up anywhere and think i need a word uh, please guide me and, and find somewhere you, you that's the wrong way to use it 
not only will it just not make sense and you'll get into a muddle, but it's sort of, it's almost like using it as an oracle deck, you know, just to guide me that way. It, it, it's not going to, it's not going to give you the wisdom. It's not the best use of it. And so this, this guidance that you're wanting, this uh, inner, inner guidance that's higher guidance, is the in, through the indwelling Holy Spirit. And the indwelling Holy Spirit will never guide you or lead you in a way that is contrary to the teachings of the Bible and the fulfilment of the teaching of the law in the person Jesus Christ. And that's because it's Jesus that said, I'll leave, I'll ask the Father to leave the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, to guide you into all truth, okay? So what does this mean? This means that you have this, if you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, and I'll talk more about how that happens in a moment, then you have this inner guidance system. It's like this moral and ethical compass about truth. Because let's face it, you know, there are many people telling you that they are telling the truth. There are many different versions of truth out there. But you can be really convinced, they can be so convincing when they are telling you that they have the truth and telling you their version of what's happening in the world and what's going to be happening. I'm thinking of the programme Traitors, I watched it recently, it was on in the UK. And it was, I say it was good, it was really compelling viewing. But this year, the traitor, unexpectedly, a little bit of a dark horse, not from the beginning, you wouldn't have predicted it, but he was so good at being a traitor. Everybody liked him, everybody trusted him. And right at the very end, you had just two people left. Uh, this girl and um, Harry, his name, I forget her name, Molly, I think it was. And when they had to vote, she even wrote his name on, a, on the chart, chart board. So there were two left and she had to get rid of one and it was like, which of the two do you trust and think isn't, is which of the two do you think is a faithful? And which of one do you want to, you know, uh, get rid of? She wrote the Harry's name and then she said, can I change my mind? And she was, her heart was, because she, she really liked him. I think she had a bit of a crush on him actually, but she really trusted him. And so she changed it and she got rid of the other person and then at the end when Harry had to reveal that he was a traitor she was just devastated it was really difficult viewing seeing somebody who'd been completely gaslit and just see it, it almost felt immoral and ethical to be viewing this as entertainment seeing that how people uh, how people's trust is manipulated and abused and so on in that way but this is life you know, the, the deceivers are so clever and it's really hard to know who to trust. So it has to go on character. Who do we trust? This is where um, the teaching about the Holy Spirit is really crucial because it's what you have personally with you and in you and with you all the time. Almost a bit like a spirit guide. If you're from the spiritual community, you'll be familiar with guides, having a spirit guide whom you speak to, or a guardian angel. And so that will be something that you, oh, wait a minute, I did want to just, I'm gonna do it now. I'm just gonna light a candle. I've forgotten to do that, but I will do it as we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is associated with fire and a flame. As you will know, or you will get to know, if you read the book of Acts, which I'm going to recommend you read in a moment, but let's have our flame here. There we go. What was I saying? The Holy Spirit being a personal guide that you can talk to, that you can commune with. So I want to talk about this idea of indwelling, what it means, because that was the question 
what it means to have an indwelling Holy Spirit. There's a famous painting by Holman Hunt, a picture, I'll try and bring it up for you now, of Jesus standing at the door. He's a, uh, he was a pre-Raphaelite painter. It's a beautiful painting and some people say that it's probably the most influential rendering of Jesus. And he's holding this lamp and what's significant is that he's knocking on the door. It's, 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 it illustrates a passage from Revelation. And the passage is Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And on the painting, there's no door or hand. There's no handle to the door on the outside meaning the door can only be opened from the inside. So Jesus can't come in without your invitation. And this is why I said in a previous video, you can't be a Christian accidentally. You know, it happens without you knowing it. It's got to be an act of will to invite Christ into your heart. What do I mean into your heart? Well, we know it's not literal. We know that the... Uh, the body, if you if you were to open the heart up, you can't locate the anatomy of the soul. And yet we do spend, tend to do this when we talk about a, a heart and we refer to the seat of our emotions and the seat of our will as well. So the mind, the mental fac faculties, isn't the way in which we receive Christ. So you don't become a Christian intellectually. Some people might... And people say that the Augustine did, it was through reason that he came to, and I know that there are people who argue the case logically for the existence of God. That's a different thing. I'm not going to deal with that today because for me, it's always been about a heart experience. And I think if you, if you go down the logical, rational route, you might miss out from the experience of Holy Spirit. And if we look at the early church, Everything was about an experience, a heart experience, a relational experience. The first disciples, uh, the first, the women actually who first found the empty tomb went to the disciples in the upper room and said, we've seen him, we've seen the Lord. They were so excited because they'd had an experience of the risen Christ. Similarly, Paul, and we'll talk about Paul lots because we can't talk about mystical Christianity without Paul because the best mystical theology is, is as a result of Paul's teaching and writing. He had this blinding revel revelation experience on the road to Damascus. It's a voice that he heard, and it, not necessarily a voice outside of ourselves, but it's to do with the, the fact that this is a relationship. It's a, a relationship with a person and a relationship that turns everything upside down and on which your faith is built. Okay, so it's heart, it's in the heart. In the Revelation passage that Holman Hunt illustrated, it says, I will come in. So you have a door to a dwelling. A dwelling is a, is a house, isn't it? A small house or a room. There's a sense of it being something, a, a place. So this is a metaphor that is used a lot, that there is a place within you where the soul resides that is a secret place and it's where the thing that you value most is. Your heart, you could say. And you're only going to allow certain people into that space because this is about trust. And as people let you down in life, as you get hurt, you perhaps lock that door, you put a barricade up around it. And that's because you want to protect yourself. Where is the self located? It's in that inner dwelling. And even the language inner is difficult because as, as I've just said, it's not inside you, even though I'm using my hands now to point. Yet there's something really important about 
embodiment. There's a reason why we use this language and there's a, it's important that we know that it's something we embody. Spiritual things aren't just out there separate and away from us, it's embodied. And Christianity is very much an embodied religion. You wouldn't think so necessarily in the way that it's been, uh, the Christian doctrine developed and the way in which the church developed it. And it was much very dualistic as though the flesh is, is, is corrupt and evil and, and spiritual things are high and pure. True Christianity is very embodied. And that's why you get Jesus coming back saying, touch me, hands, feel me. I'm real, I'm flesh and blood. And the incarnation is central to the Christian uh, message, the Christian doctrine. When somebody thinks about something, maybe they're remembering something. And even, I do this a lot on videos, if I'm trying to listen to something more subtle, an inspiration, an inspired word, I defocus, my eyes will go away from objects and things and my gaze will soften, I look away. What's happening there? Where am I going to listen? I'm leaning in, but I'm not trying to hear a voice in the room. I'm trying to get information. And that's this idea of going to an inner place. So I'm defocusing from the objects in the room, from the external so-called world out there, to a place of accessing information that is somewhere else. This might just be a vo vibrational change of place, you know, a, a vibrational level or whatever it is. But this is something you may be familiar with if you are from a spiritual background. That you, the way that you go and you try to uh, get centered, talk about getting centered and listening and waiting. And this waiting and dwelling and being comfortable with that is really foundational for this relationship because you'll get to know the voice of Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I know my sheep and my sheep know my voice. I'm the good shepherd, he used that analogy. But you might be thinking, why am I switching between talking about Jesus and talking about the Holy Spirit? As I say, that one and the same, just think of it as one and the same. And the most important thing to say about Holy Spirit, by the way, is that it sounds as though we're talking about something ethereal when we mention spirit. <clears throat> they even used to talk about Holy Ghost before, which I thought was really quite creepy as a child and never really liked that name. But the important thing is theologically to know is that Holy Spirit is a person. And so you have a personal relationship with Holy Spirit and you will hear them, him, her, doesn't matter, it transcends gender, it doesn't matter which one we use, speaking to you as a person would speak to you. The main reason to have the Holy Spirit in your heart, the indwelling Holy Spirit, and to choose that is because it leads into all truth. So how are we going to do it? I'm going to read to you from uh, a song, and this came to mind when I was preparing for today. It's a song that's a, it's a poem really, and I love, I love it. I always return to this song. It's got some old fashioned language a little bit because it was written about a hundred years ago, perhaps not quite a hundred years ago, but it, it uses poetic language. And so I'm going to just read, read it to you and, and, and talk a little bit about what it means. And then I'm going to let you use that if you want to as a prayer 
so that you can use this opportunity to invite Holy Spirit into your own life if you haven't already done so. Mid all the traffic of the ways, turmoils without within, making my heart a quiet place and come and dwell therein. Mid all the traffic of the ways, in the middle of a life that is busy, fast paced, bewildering, noisy, where there's, it's difficult to hear the still small voice because it's so noisy and there are so many different conflicting voices and it's stressful. Turmoils without within, turmoil, old fashioned word again, agitation, uh, strife, struggle, war, turmoil, confusion, chaos, without meaning outside and within. So in the, in the world outside, but also in me, in, inside my mind. It's busy, it's noisy, it's confusing, there's turmoil. Mid all of that happening, make in my heart a quiet place and come and dwell therein. That's a prayer you might want to make. I'm going to list, write out the verse of this song in the notes so that you can return to it and say it quietly to yourself, by yourself rather, because you're not alone. You're never alone. And I'm going to suggest that you allow for three minutes, just wait for three minutes. <laughs> That's 23 for the Trinity, the Trinitarian number. Three minutes just to sit after making that prayer and just observe and notice. The song goes on. A little shrine, this inner place is a little shrine of quietness. Isn't that beautiful? A little shrine of quietness, all sacred to thyself, where thou shalt all my soul possess, and I shall find myself. I love these words. A little shrine of quietness, all sacred to thyself, where thou shalt all my soul possess. This is how you know that the demons can't get in, because you invite the Holy Spirit to possess you. That might sound creepy. It means you say, I want to serve. There is a kind of, well, there is a loyalty that comes from this. You're making a choice of a commitment when you choose to follow Christ and when you invite him into your heart. It's a covenant. You belong to him and he belongs to you. This is why the mystics often use the uh, metaphor of the lover. Like lovers are the most intimate relationship you can have. You give yourself to the other and the other gives your, themselves to you and you know this blissful union. But it's also the loyalty and the trust is there. You know that you are loved completely and that person will never let you down but you desire them and they desire you as much. And it's a, it's a beautiful image. And it's one that we can relate to as, as human beings. We either have had that experience or we yearn for it. And we find it here in a marriage of the soul. The soul is wedded to the Christ. And so you have that image of Christ the lover, if you like, of the soul. Jesus is the lover of my soul and this is another song I could quote from another song Jesus tender lover of my soul um, keeper of the garden of my heart Jesus thou art everything to me that's right Jesus tender lover of my soul partner of my sins and friend indeed keeper of the garden of my heart Jesus thou art everything to me Beautiful. That's what I love about this, about the songs. Some of these songs that don't really use, but this is my Salvation Army songbook. I've had it for, I can't ever let it go because there's so much theology in these songs, but they're love songs. 
and there's a lot of mystical theology because uh, this uh, relationship is transformational. The Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit, will lead us into a holy alchemy. Again, that's for another day. Can't do it all in one video. There's lots to teach on this. And if, if this is really whetting your appetite, then please do hang around, stick around, because this is the sort of teaching I'm going to be giving, holiness teaching, sanctification. It's, it's metaphysics. It's sacred alchemy. And uh, like the person who wrote said, that there's, a, there's a different calibre to this guidance. It's higher and it's purer. You can't get any higher. It's as good as it gets. A little place of mystic grace. I'm still reading from this song. A little place of mystic grace of self and sin swept bare where I may look into thy face and talk with thee in prayer. Come, occupy my silent place and make thy dwelling there. More grace is wrought in quietness than any is aware. So use that prayer. If it speaks to you, if it resonates with you, as an invitation for the Holy Spirit to come and dwell within your heart. Sit and wait. Notice, observe. And let's take it from there. If you have any comments or questions, please ask in the comments section. Please subscribe if you aren't already subscribed so that you'll be notified every time I make a video. And uh, look forward to speaking again with you next time. Bye for now. God bless.